So we have an amazing panel of folks who are actually doing the innovation here. Um, so we're going to hear about what it's going to take in energy uh, to actually make this revolution that we've been discussing happen. And uh, my, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Hayes, who runs the uh, practice in Ireland for KPMG to lead the panel. Mike. Thank you, Brett, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, you probably find on stage your largest panel at this session today, and we've only got 45 minutes, so we're going to go through this fairly quickly. We particularly want to focus on the whole question of sustainable energy innovation, what's happening in the world, what do we need to do, particularly with a focus on the climate change environment and the Paris Agreement targets that have been set. Innovation is a topic that it's discussed all over the world, but one of the real issues that I encounter in my, in my day job, and I, I head up the, the KPMG's global renewables practice, is the lack of funding and the lack of support that innovators keep telling me that we're getting. That's one of the key topics we want to discuss this afternoon. We also want to talk about what are the areas we should focus on in terms of sustainable energy innovation. And I want to make it local as well. I want to discuss with the panel what role does Houston have to play and what special advantages does Houston bring to this agenda. So we have a large panel. I'm just going to do a very quick introduction. I'm going to start off with, with Charlie here on my right and a very quick introduction on what you do and your role in the world of, of sustainable energy innovation. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Charlie Bowser. I'm from NetPower. NetPower is a joint venture between four companies, Eight Rivers Capital, who invented the alum cycle, uh, which I'll talk a, bit, a little bit about, uh, and Exelon, McDermott, and our latest investor is Occidental, Oxy Low Carbon Ventures. NetPower, the alum cycle, is a natural gas-fired, oxy-fueled combustion process uh, in supercritical CO2, and at no extra cost, we capture 100% of the carbon We've built a demonstration plant in Laporte, Texas, and the next phase for our company is to sell 300 megawatt commercial units. Mark, if I turn over to you. Sure, you bet, thanks. I'm, I'm Mark Colmer, I'm with Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, the climate investments arm. I'm actually seconded from Occidental. And I'm right now leading a team that is looking at CCUS projects around the world for investment for our billion dollar investment fund. Varun. I'm Varun Rai, I'm director of the University of Texas at Austin Energy Institute, and there I work on synthesizing and catalyzing interdisciplinary energy research uh, across UT Austin, uh, all the way from storage to renewables to oil and gas, uh, uh, methane, as well as water and energy. So uh, really looking cross-cutting across different disciplines. Brilliant, thank you. Tim. So Tim Copra, partner with Blue Bear Capital. We're located in Houston, Texas and in Los Angeles. We're a venture fund and we focus on data-driven technology companies within the energy supply chain. So you can think of it as Silicon Valley tech, like data analytics, machine learning, AI, cyber, IoT, but applies specifically to oil and gas, wind, solar, and energy storage. Thank you, Tim. Sadas. Yes, uh, Sadas Shankar. I'm with uh, Harvard, uh, but I, I have, I'm also part of a new independent initiative on materials and design of materials for sustainability. Uh, and I have been involved with Brett when Brett was at uh, Harvard as well. So that's how I'm part of this and looking forward to the panel. Thank, thank you, Sadas. And last but by no means least, Wade. And Wade, I'd like you just briefly to talk to us a little bit about the Plug and Play initiative, which I think you said was announced yesterday. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, yes, my name is Wade Bitaraf. I'm the founder and director of Energy and Sustainability at Plug and Play. Uh, Plug and Play, in a nutshell, is uh, uh, one of the most active early stage investors globally. Uh, we also are uh, one of the largest corporate innovation platforms with 32 locations uh, that are decentralized around the world. So in our practice, uh, we create a consortium of large energy companies from oil and gas to electric utilities value chain uh, that are looking to transform their businesses. They can either reduce the cost of operations today or uh, diversify their resources to renew, renewable resources and more uh, emerging markets. That sounds like a fantastic initiative and, and best of luck with it. I want to start off the discussion and we will give the audience a, a, an opportunity to contribute as well. You know, it seems to me we're entering into a golden age of sustainable energy innovation. There is a lot of innovation, a lot of projects happening around the world, innovators coming up, not just in this country, but I, I literally see them four corners of the world. I want to put a question to Sadas and Varun to begin with. 
where do you think we should focus our efforts? If, if we really believe we're entering into a period of what we now call a climate emergency, do you think we should just continue just letting everybody innovate where they want, or do you think we should start to think about focus? Okay. So um, I spent uh, 20 years at Intel before I moved to Harvard. So I, uh, this innovation thing, being in Silicon Valley, has been a, has been a big thing. And I'm sure we, uh, we will have things to talk about it as well. So you hear the word innovation. So if you were to look, describe innovation as a mathematical expression, what would that be? Have you thought about it? You hear it all the time. So being in engineering, uh, being on the engineering school and also was an engineer throughout, I try to look at, it, look at things in terms of mathematics and specifically, can you actually come up with something? So the formula that seems to work uh, when I looked at numbers was innovation is equal to invention times translation. So you could have a lot of inventions, but if it does not get translated into practice, you don't have innovation. Um, now, the, the question that Mike asked, what does it cost on innovation? The first thing I want to take an example because I deal with the real examples. Um, you have all heard of iPhone, and I'm sure. And iPhone is uh, considered a very innovative, disruptive thing that changed the whole mobile industry. Do you know how many countries or how many cities were involved in the products that went into iPhone? Can anybody even guess? Maybe I will reach out to the panel. Can somebody guess how many cities were involved in the things that went into iPhone that made it unique? 500. Hmm? 500. No, uh, well, <laughs> the things that really made a difference. Okay. Not all the components, I mean. I'm not talking about Five. manufacturing. Yeah, it's, it's order of 10. But you know that Silicon Valley is associated with iPhone. Out of those 10 cities distinctly involved, only four are based out of Silicon Valley. Six are outside. Uh, and it took 60 years. 1947 was the first invention that one of which went into iPhone, and I can tell you the details later. The reason I am giving these numbers is any innovation takes a long time, 60 years, 1947 to 2007 when the iPhone was announced, 10 cities, out of which the Silicon Valley was involved only in four. If you stretch it, you could say five. If you say LA and Pasadena are part of Silicon Valley. Uh, then it would be five. Uh, but essentially, the point I'm trying to make is innovation is never an isolated solution. It's always there is an ecosystem, and there needs to be a lot of inventions and a longer-term things. So sustainable energy is no different, answering your question, Mike. Uh, the reason I gave that example was so that you have a time frame of what it would take, which means somebody needs to underwrite those 60 years of inventions and work. So if you're thinking about it from an energy of the future, there needs to be a thought that this is a marathon that we are getting to start running on. It's not going to end in the fifth mile or sixth mile. It needs to go on. So now, I just wanted to add one more thing before I pass it on to Wade is Houston is uniquely poised, having been in Silicon Valley and now in East Coast in Boston. The skill set of people here in Houston are uniquely different. It is, it is one of the places where you get people who have been solving the harder problems associated with energy. Repurposing your skill set is much easier than creating an ecosystem to do that. So I, I did look up at the kind of skill set available. In my mind, the innovation thing for clean Houston is not going to be very different than for the clean US or the clean world. Uh, and the skill set is here, but 
you need partners with both the Silicon Valley and the East Coast and probably outside. That would be my rough summary. Okay, well, this. thank you. Can I just turn to Varun? So if you had a crystal ball, what are the areas across the sustainable energy spectrum that you think innovators should focus on? Bearing in mind the comment from Sadas, we don't have 60 years, unfortunately, with this particular agenda. So we're very much de dealing with you know, a, a situation, innovation takes time, but actually it's the one commodity we do not have. Thank you for that question. I think the question of time is extremely important. I'll quickly leave with three thoughts and then we can uh, have more discussion. One is uh, we need innovation in a much, much broader sense across the, uh, across the ecosystem. Uh, because of the timing aspect, right? We don't have the uh, leisure of uh, time. If I would really point out, you know, storage is, is very, I think, extremely important. Carbon capture and storage is extremely important because it is tied to how the oil and gas industry, in particular, is able to kind of, you know, transition and shift and, and be part of uh, the energy system uh, in, in a few decades. Uh, and a third, third area, which we heard about. Uh, much in the morning is, is hydrogen. Hydrogen is very interesting for a variety of reasons for, for what it can do for transportation, but, but also for industrial emissions, right? You know, <coughs> how the full value chain there integrates potentially with reducing uh, emissions in the industrial sector, that, that becomes very important. I think the other facet of, you know, it's not just the, you know, having the invention going to innovation, but here, how do you scale it up to make a very, very uh, rapid, big scale uh, uh, impact. There, I, th I think some of the biggest bottlenecks lie there in terms of timing. Uh, where we have failed a lot uh, in the past, there is a danger uh, of, of doing that same mistake in the, as we try to rapidly scale some of these technologies over the next two, three decades, is not learning adequately between the different cycles of the technologies as we scale up. One of the things, one of the ways in which energy technologies are very different from some other technologies is as you scale these up, the risks don't necessarily get uh, mitigated in a linear fashion, right? Because as you scale it up, your material processes are different. You know, your construction and engineering is, uh, design is different. So what you learned before is not necessarily what uh, really applies to the next level of scaling. So one has to be very, very careful in terms of designing the learning cycles as you move up. My final point here will be, uh, you know, where do universities, you know, being from uh, one of the uh, tier one universities across the world, where do universities play a role as we try to bring in new innovations and try to scale them up uh, rapidly? There, there also, I think there, is a, there has to be a lot of uh, rethinking and redesign of how we at the university take our ideas and, and, and papers and innovations, try to scale that up. We don't think, except for a few places, we have not figured that out in particular because you know, timing was not an issue. Uh, but timing is a big issue now and so you know how University work gets coupled, for example, with you know, uh, uh, venture capital uh, work and that whole ecosystem. Uh, that's a huge area where we need to focus also. It's a theme I want to come back to in a couple of minutes. Maybe just get a couple of perspectives from a couple of other people. Mark, OGCI clearly has got a very specific area of focus. Can you talk to us a little bit about the thinking behind OGCI and where you see the initiative going in the next five years? Sure, you bet. I appreciate that. And uh, I guess I give applause to uh, Charlene Russell, who kind of maybe stole my thunder a little bit about what OGCI is about, so I won't repeat that part. Uh, but we are focused on uh, energy efficiency, as we heard our lunchtime speaker, Amory, uh, hit upon as a, a really big, important uh, aspect. We're also uh, focused on methane reduction, which you also heard as well. And in that regard, we have invested in GHGSAT, which is a greenhouse gas satellite circling the Earth every 48 hours, uh, pointing out where there are large methane leaks so we can reduce those. Kairos Aerospace, which currently right now is uh, flying over the Permian Basin, finding uh, methane leaks to reduce those. As we heard our lunchtime speaker uh, mention, those are quite critical. The other space we're really working in is CCUS, and, and we've heard uh, Varun and we've heard lots of other speakers mention CCUS. And there really isn't a rational discussion going on around around climate change that doesn't involve some component of CCUS. So we see that at OGCI and the climate investments as a space that has to be acted upon really quickly. I, I like to use the analogy that CCUS might be dialysis for a planet that needs a kidney transplant, um, and that's okay. We've got to work in that dialysis space over the next couple, multiple decades in order to effect an, a good transition over to other solutions. Okay, thank you. Wade, very interested in your perspective on, on areas of focus for, for the, the innovation agenda. Sure. Uh, so I'll take one step back and talk a little bit about why we decided to be a little bit more active in the energy space. 
So about three years ago, uh, you know, we were based in Silicon Valley and we saw a number of large corporations that are shopping for strategic investment uh, in the startups. So, uh, so we, that's one of the key considerations that we decided to be kind of focused on that space. And over time, we spend a lot of time understanding what are the top pain points and priorities of large corporate stakeholders in the industry. And we learned quickly that you know, sustainability is one of the key driving forces behind their cost allocation and investment decisions. So uh, we launched our you know, industry-specific vertical uh, summer of 2017. Uh, we call it energy and sustainability. Uh, we believe that this, the future of this space will be decarbonized, digitized, and decentralized. And many of our tech scouting efforts and investment decisions are, are driven by those metrics. Uh, so do our corporate partners in the space. So a lot of, for our investment spectrum is pretty broad. We see a lot of applications of data analytics and machine learning from, from the molecules and electrons scale to devices, to systems, and more importantly, systems of systems. So a lot of interesting areas that, you know, Silicon Valley tech investment type uh, solutions can really inform dialogues for the stakeholders to, to make more efficient decisions in trading their assets, in monitoring, and tracking some of their resources so they can reduce the cost of operations, increase efficiency, or, or frankly speaking, build new products and services that, that might be very valuable from a customer service or concierge perspective. So, uh, so we have 12 industry-specific verticals, uh, and quite frankly, half of my job is to, to pull the resources from the adjacent industries and to, um, to this point about you know, cross-verticalization and repurposing some of the existing solutions. We see a lot of uh, interesting areas of focus in supply chain and logistics, where we work with some of the sh largest shipping companies, railroads, maritime, um, and transportation companies that can apply to the energy sector. We see a lot of interesting technologies in, in real estate and construction space uh, to, to electrify some of the assets and increase energy efficiency. Uh, we have a new materials and packaging focus program. We see a lot of interest in areas in, in biodegradable technology, uh, materials, uh, substitute materials, advanced nanotechnologies. Um, and then lastly, our mobility uh, practice, some of the largest car makers, auto, automobile manufacturers, OEM suppliers that are looking to build this kind of value chain that are looking to work with entrepreneurs that can do some of their uh, projects cheaper, faster, and greener. So we have a whole swath of technologies that we think are applicable to the energy sector. And um, yesterday, Mayor Turner uh, of, of Houston announced our launch of newest office in Houston. We we're really excited to, to kind of create an import-export opportunities for those startups that are spread around the world to come to Houston and, and meet with stakeholders, whether they're from corporations, academia, or uh, public and private sector. So we're looking to work with the ecosystem with the intention of helping not only the, the local ecosystem, but also broader global uh, technology landscape. Great, I, I think it's a fantastic initiative and I actually hope it's something that gets replicated in other parts of the world. I want to turn the discussion around to what is the global theme on innovation and I wanted to debate it with the panel as to whether they agree with it or not and I'm going to kick off with Charlie. That's the whole question is, are we getting the funding required to the innovation sector? I work with innovators all around the world and most of them, if not all of them, tell me, you know, and they might have fantastic ideas, brilliant innovations, but they're not getting the access to finance at two stages. First stage is the, what I call the early stage startups that just need, you know, a, a modest amount of capital to develop. And then we keep hearing about the so-called value of debt as innovators try to scale up. So I'd like to get a perspective from, from a, a, a real innovator <coughs> innovation company and Charlie do you agree with that and do you think there are other issues as well impacting on, on, on innovators? Well I mean I certainly think access to capital can be a barrier uh, to innovation. Um, I want to respond a little bit to what uh, Sada said earlier. I mean if we give ourselves the framework of 60 years is okay for, for uh, innovation I think we're, we're in trouble. Um, what I do think is that the traditional forms of funding for innovation um, have changed, well, we've moved away from them. I mean, traditionally, we've looked to the DOE and, and foundations to provide funding. Um, I think what you're seeing now, and, and uh, Wade kind of mentioned it or also, and OGCI are leading 
in that you're seeing the corporations begin to fund innovation because they see that if they don't, these disruptive technologies will come about behind their back, basically, and they'll be left without a market. So um, that's, you know, net power is not funded with any government or foundation funding. It's all um, corporations. So I think that's, that's the change that we're seeing. And can I ask, do you think there's more the government, both at a federal and a state level, should be doing, given the importance of this agenda? Well, so I think that's two different questions. The, the government, um, I think what we've seen, the trend, especially in DOE, is they've become more risk-averse, um, and it's been harder to get funding because they've had problems, you know, Solyndra and, and things like that. I think what you're seeing at the state and the city levels is that they're starting, because of that, they're starting to become more engaged. Uh, so, especially, you know, wind and solar PPAs, you saw cities and municipalities signing PPAs for, yep. for renewables, so I agree. Good. Tim, I'd like to get your views on this. I mean, you, you represent probably the capital side of this and um, very, a very active investor. Very interested in your perspective in terms of what you see in your market and even more, more broader globally. Yeah, sure. So, you know, we're definitely within the, the spectrum of technology development and acceptability. We're at the place where it's really being commercialized. And so when we look at companies, for example, we're only investing in companies that already have recurring commercial revenue. And for us, that helps de-risk the, the technology piece, and then we can help with business growth by introduction to our network of potential customers. And so we help accelerate it that way. But I think you really need it within the ecosystem of, of helping new technology grow. You really need both, right? We need the, the kinds of organizations uh, that are focused on impact, like Mark's, and we need academia that's developing technologies at TRL 1, 2, and 3 level to bring that forward. So all of those different elements come together so that we can actually get to the place where they accelerate. And I think one thing that's really interesting that what we're seeing, whether it's uh, traditional energy like oil and gas or renewables, there's a greater acceptance to use a lot of the technologies that have been accepted in other industries that help to improve efficiencies and operations and maintenance. And what that does is it shows the acceptability of that new technology. So you know, at this point, we're transitioning from oil field services, for example, but you'll start to see, I think, renewable field services as you have more mature wind and solar that needs that support. And that same sort of technology for improving efficiencies and operations and maintenance will then be applied to carbon capture and utilization and other, other components. So a question to you, Tim, and to the rest of the, of, of the panel. I want you to talk, somebody talk to me about the investment community. So I think Charlie mentioned there are clearly some organizations where it's in their own self-interest to, to invest because they don't want to be bypassed. But I want to look to the broader investment community, the institutional investors, you know, the big corporate investors, the foundations, family wealth. Do you think that they are actually looking at the energy innovation agenda as a good area to invest, or do you think we need to do more work to educate them? It's full spectrum, and I can say that because, you know, as a, a venture fund, we're also entrepreneurs. We go out, we fundraise, and so we get the pulse of family offices on the West Coast, East Coast, uh, institutions and where they sit, and it's completely full spectrum. There are some family offices on the West Coast that are going to divest all of their investments that touch hydrocarbons, for example. And then you have family offices that really have no sort of technology understanding and, and just now starting to dabble. But I think there's an increased interest in ESG in general, and that plays into new technology for, for energy. So I think you know, what we've seen over really since we started the fund a little, bit, a little bit over two and a half years ago is this increased awareness of uh, incorporating technology into new energies. And even uh, functions like this, I mean, two and a half years ago, you wouldn't see a forum, forum like this. Yep. You might have 10 people in the room, but now you know, our, all of our schedules are jammed with these kinds of events where we can go and learn more. So there's a growing awareness, and I think that you know, Houston is going to play a huge part in that. You know, we have uh, plug and play coming to Houston, but we have Mass Challenge here, uh, bringing Greentown Labs. We have great incubators. And all those things are going to be really synergistic to developing the technology, the entrepreneurship, and the innovation within the city. I'll just, if I can add, uh, Mike. I think, you know, the general sense that the investor community is, is active in a, in a broad sense, and I see that only getting stronger, right? You know, that, that, that we all have a sense for. One of the things that I really believe can accelerate that process of how the investor community, I mean, you know, one of the things we hear is, is 
are we dealing with too many options, too many technologies, do we have enough capital? When you look at a, a single firm, maybe you don't have enough capital to invest among the different, different options. But I think overall, uh, a lot of capital will come to, to potentially fund a lot of these options and you know, take some of them to scale. I don't think that, you know, from my perspective, I don't think that's the problem. Where I do think there is a very important ecosystem need is for the ecosystem to figure out how as these different technological options, these innovations, as they move through the hoops and as they mature along that line, uh, there is no systematic way as, as yet of signaling the technological and market maturity as the technologies progress. That's a huge ecosystem gap. A, a lot of the VCs do a lot of hard work but still, you know, it is, it, is, it is their own assessment. How do those assessments get integrated by, by a set of actors, set of institutions that broadly signals to the market as to what the maturity uh, level, technological and market, of these technologies is? So I think you know, that's important that will really coalesce the investor community even, even faster. One thing that I've noticed is increased collaboration between VCs that are focused on energy and new technology. So, we collaborate with, with your organization, Mark, and lots of other VCs, and it's, it's interesting to watch the whole spectrum of, of uh, investment. So where you all have invested in Keros Aerospace and, uh, and other technologies that are similar, we've actually looked at the same thing. So it's, it's that, uh, that spectrum of you looking at ones that are commercially viable and then ones that are not going to be there, and ones that we look at that are very commercially viable to even more mature. And the more that we collaborate and have good conversations and relationships, the more you make those interconnections. Yeah, and if, and if I can add to that as well, what we're seeing, I can tell you in the last 48 hours, I've been contacted by a family fund, I've been contacted by one of the biggest foundations in the United States, and I've been contacted by an industrial manufacturer struggling to understand how they could make CCUS happen with their facilities. It's not their core business. Right. So while we need passive investors as well, one of the things that Climate Investments does is it takes a more active role and is able to connect you know, to organizations like Tim's, to, to the big, to the small, and also to the different state regulators and the different components that allow these things to happen. So we take that active role in the middle space to help them get their front end engineering and design done. So. Um, or whatever they need on the, early, on the early phase so that the people with the bigger checks can come in and have more surety in the investment. So that's, I think you wanted to contribute. Yes, um, I mean, I'm not involved in VC, so I'm not an expert in that, but one of your earlier questions, I didn't think I answered it, so I wanted okay. to get back to you. You asked about um, where should we focus on our energy innovation efforts. Um, one thing that people may be aware, I mean, people may be aware intuitively, but they may not have seen this. Over the past 40 years in US, uh, basic research has been on a downward trend uh, from the funding agencies and corporations which used to fund, uh, I, I want to state the problem and then I will tell you what uh, my perspective on it. The corporations which used to do the R&D no longer fund R&D at the same level. If you look at the top five brands and the top highest market capitalizations today, none of those five companies existed 40 years back. Uh, they are the Amazons, the Apples. Um, Apple probably barely existed 40 years back. Uh, Facebook, Google, and Microsoft. They are not what you would call traditional, except for Apple. None of them deal with materials. Mm -hmm. And they are the ones which whom the market is rewarding the most. So my, it, it comes back to the question that translation is languishing quite a bit. Most of the corporations, you don't see Corning, you don't see Intel, you don't see Exxon, you don't see GE. Those companies are not rewarded by the market as the other companies I spoke about. So there's a real issue. Now, coming back to translation as being not discussed in detail, even the shells, the BPs, I'm not sure how much of that is focused on translation because they have a quarter to quarter profit the Wall Street is driving. 
which essentially determines most of the decisions, as far as I could see as an outsider. Now, coming back to the Mike's question of what, where would you focus on the investment? Uh, materials, I would say, has not been ignored, uh, but it has not enough focus has been built in US. Uh, the reason materials are important is they are the substrata on which everything else is built, all the way devices and all that for energy uh, sustainability. Materials are also the things that could bring the unit cost down if done right, efficiently. And the third problem, which we all kick down the road, is these materials end back, end back in the environment, 20 or 25 years if there's a photovoltaic. And if there are toxic materials, they are going to end in somebody's backyard somewhere. It may be in Houston. Uh, it may be elsewhere. Many of you may not know, New York ships lot of its waste to Alabama because Alabama gets paid for accepting New York's waste. So there are going to be poorer states in US which are going to get these materials in one form or the other, or poorer nations which are going to receive these materials elsewhere. So the translational part and the long-term sustainability and circularity that was discussed also need to be part of it. Here is where I think Houston can play a very nice role of nucleating this kind of sustainability discussion points which nobody else is touching. Okay, and we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, Charlie, just want to bring it back to you. So you've heard actually quite a positive message from, you know, from the investment community. Um, yes, I can tell you this is something we really do struggle with around the world. So my own sense is we've, there's more we need to do to match the capital that, that is out there with, with, with innovators. We're, we're not going to solve it today. Other than capital, do you see any other barriers in your role as, a, as an innovator? Is it just a question of money or, or are there other things that could be done? In particular, could the government do more to create a first market for your product? Um, well, in terms of barriers, I mean, the barriers that we um, think about that are non-monetary um, really come down to execution. You know, I mean, some of the large failures that we've seen have been due in, in large part to the execution. The ideas were valid, the technology worked, they failed in execution. Uh, so, you know, what we've tried to do is, and, and the Eight Rivers engineers always make fun of me, but I, but I say, bring your steel toes, because we're going out in the field to look at this thing, right? Um, so we got to focus on execution, I think, okay. uh, if we're going to make these, the ideas go to market. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And that really kind of hits on, to me, one of the spaces Houston can play very well in. You know, why did Trailing Net Power choose to put that plant in the port? Well, because there are people who, here who do wear steel toes. Uh, we have techn technical people in, in quite abundance, and we also have a, a rich history in uh, innovation. If we look down at, at the ship channels, was alluded to previously, uh, there's a lot going on in that space. So we really need to look at what we have here and not try to recreate Silicon Valley or anything like that. Grow from what we have in the innovative space. So we've got technical people. We've got people who can go out and work uh, with a net power. Um, we, can, we can build the space and get from the, uh, the early folks like the plug and play or passive investors on the, on the small side to the medium space where enablers where OGCI fits in to the large check people and create that pipeline. But in Houston, we can really do that with the things that make sense with our own history. If I might. No, please. Yeah. Uh, I'll respond to this question by connecting back to Sadas's comment about the, you know, the Amazons and Googles and so on. One of, the, one of the biggest challenges that I have found through my research is when you look from the lenses of investors, and let's, let's say uh, VCs in particular, you have, you have a number of different general partners, you know, focusing on different parts, portfolios. And when you bring in the energy investments vis-a-vis -vis the other, for example, IT or semiconductors, or, you know, all, it, it becomes a difficult conversation just within a few years, you know, yeah. when you think about raising next round of funds. Uh, and that's where I think, you know, there is, there is a lot of need, both on the policy side as well as the social community side, to have much firmer uh, visibility into and, and stability about demand in the shorter run. 
that type of uh, visibility into what the demand is can really make the, the processes as well as the investments by different uh, actors uh, much simpler and could address some of the value of death questions you read. But I, I found that, that being a very, when you have different options and some options are yielding certain types of results just because what's being rewarded in the market, then you have to start thinking very hard about, well, where is the policy? Because there are multiple external, externalities happening. We value them, but not as reflected in the, in the market and in our policies. I just wanted to amplify yep. what, uh, what Charlie said about it. it's really about execution. The other limitation oftentimes we see is about connectivity with the customers. And to Mark's point, one of the strengths of, of Houston is that we have the customer base here. And so what that does is it helps, you know, for someone like us or another venture fund, we can introduce uh, an e-commerce business, for example, which is relatively straightforward to customers. Or, you know, like Sembita Factory, which is uh, carbon capture and utilization here in town because they have oil and gas connectivity and understanding and relationships, they can help to, to foster that as well. So one of the strengths of Houston is really about having all the customers here and the relationships to make it happen. Okay. Wade, just interested in your, in your perspective. Sure. I mean, do you see the barriers as just financial or would you adhere to this idea that execution is, is a big issue as well? Sure. So just piggybacking on a few points, yep. Tim and uh, Mark mentioned, and tying it back to a couple of questions you've asked previously. So we've seen a lot of different ingredients that are required to make this digital transformation that results in uh, reducing carbon emissions and, and green, greenhouse gas. So I'll use a quick uh, example. About three years ago, uh, we were working with Daimler out of our Silicon Valley office, and uh, they just recently celebrated their 20 years anniversary with 300 uh, you know, top engineers that are looking to you know, innovate Daimler, and Daimler is going massive uh, transformation. You know, nobody wants to own the car, and, and all the engines are becoming, you know, electric vehicles, and, and they need to find a way to, to catch with the trends. And we were doing some maybe three or four pilot projects with Daimler every year, and, um, and it all changed when we received the chairman of the board of Daimler, Dr. Seche, who asked us to go to, to Stuttgart and, and work with them. And we, we told them, where is Stuttgart? And what happens is, in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and, um, and then, you know, sure enough, after you know, two years and a half, we were able, together with Daimler, uh, University of Stuttgart, City of Stuttgart, uh, build one of the largest innovation platforms for the mobility sector, where today we work with maybe 25 of the largest car makers and automotive manufacturers and suppliers. And recently we had BP joined that initiative uh, together with BASF and some of the other large suppliers where they do more than 100 pilot projects. So this you know, truly transformed the culture of the companies and embracing this uh, external innovation. And, and this is what we see we can do in Houston. There's a lot of components already exist. Fourth largest city in the US, uh, one of the most diverse cities here in America. And uh, a lot of different components exist. I would say denying the fact that, you know, depending on how you define energy innovation, denying the fact that it's, it's a challenging space, uh, it, it's not wise. You know, we, we work with nearly 200 large um, investors in Silicon Valley and, you know, a handful of which only focus on energy sector. But I think, uh, you know, tying it back to the role of corporations that we talked today, some of the previous panels and the trends that we see, we think that if, if the corporate stakeholders here slightly change the mindset of, of their uh, internal stakeholders and embrace this cultural change, we can make significant impact. And we see it with likes of you know, Shell and Chevron and ExxonMobil that are, are you know, forward thinking and then they've established very innovative arms to, to bring in these technologies. And we look forward to contributing to, to that change that we think can increase the amount of pilot projects and proof of concepts that can help the entrepreneurs test out their ideas quickly, build their products, and, and hopefully create uh, market standards uh, in a 12 to 18 months turnaround. Thank you. One final topic I wanted to cover before we put it out to the audience. We've heard some really positive comments about the potential for Houston to actually become a center for, for innovation and to you know, leverage the skills that are here. I'll put this to all of you. Are there things the city of Houston should be doing to make this a reality? I think I can. I mean, I wanted to tag on to what Mark had said about Houston. You know, we, we built this plant down here, and our technology partner is Toshiba, who's 
Japanese, and naturally they feel like everything needs to be made in Japan and sent over here to the U.S. And you know, more often than not, they would give us a lead time. We'd say, send us the drawing, and and we could make it here in Houston for for half the cost and half the time. And I think maybe we need to let the world know that everything can be made here in, in Houston. Any others? I had one thing, and that is that uh, Houston is doing a phenomenal amount to. To, uh, to grow this innovation ecosystem. The one area which can always use more work is that interconnectivity between the super majors and those that uh, are the innovators within those organizations. The closer we have ties with those groups, the more they'll be able to see deal flow, technology, have understanding, and, and help those companies foster and grow. Great. One of the things, if I can add, is bringing the university in the mix. So, you know, we, we have Rice here, we have U of H here, yep. Yep. but then you look at the little bit broader of the ecosystem, so Houston, San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, you know, I think, you know, you rise a little bit above bringing more of that uh, intellectual horsepower to combine with the extreme uh, energy expertise that lies, I think that's an area where we can use some more work as well. Yeah. Great, I mean, the message I'm being left with is this incredible potential for Houston by, by embracing this, this agenda. I'm conscious we've only a couple of minutes left. I'm not sure if Brett wanted to say something, but I did want to put it out. I'm going to let maybe one or two questions from the audience if anyone wants to chime in. While they're thinking about that, I can add some, uh, <laughs> I can add some flavor to Houston. Uh, you know, I think success breeds success, and there, there are many great things going on here. I, I mean, I think there's, uh, it's incumbent upon the press as well, too, to Laura and others who have connections with the press, to uh, flash up some of these success stories. It's not just about creating um, space for innovators to sit. It's about sharing what those innovators are doing. You know, there's, there's a group of mm -hmm. uh, a bunch of Yale MEs sitting on the east side of Houston in a warehouse with air conditioning right now who've created a great robotic solution to, to some tech. Well, that, that needs to kind of get out there and, and show that. Uh, likewise, uh, with Climate Investments, uh, we're, while the companies we have probably add up to over a thousand years of experience, we've only been around less than two years. So I've got five people here now, we're going to have 20 by the end of next year, we're getting office space here, and we're totally tied in to all the innovative spaces. So we actually need to bring those things to the forefront and, and share those, and it, that success brings more people here and it builds upon itself. Yeah. Right. Okay. Last call. Any uh, any questions from the audience? Okay. Let's thank the panel. Uh, Mike, great job. Thanks thank to you. the panel.